Well, hello! I'm Riga, and welcome to the new and improved You Alright. As always, I'm fashionably late, which means it is now over a week away from relevance. There is something I would like to talk about, because it is that time again. Time for Game Freak to suck our pockets dry with the promise of digital combat and companionship. That is, of course, not to mention the ability to delude ourselves into thinking that we too are young children with an entire life of adventure ahead of us rather than the crushing reality that we are using the digital adventures of voiceless bland characters and avatars to escape the realization that you're a fully grown adult who wasted your chance at adventure and now sit alone at home hoping for some excitement that will never come so you make YouTube videos in a vain hope of recapturing the lost spark of joy in life. Uh, Pokemon. It's, it's time for Pokemon. Another big Pokemon game, actually. They're really stepping up the production pace of these things. But hey, that's fine with me, the consumer. I get to enjoy more Pokemon. And I'm sure their employees, from artists to programmers and the development team, are being handsomely compensated and cared for fairly by their employers. Or, you know, they want money. Could be that, I suppose. If there's one thing we can all agree on, it's that Pokemon has not made enough money. So here it is, Scarlet and Violet. Two versions once again, because it's tradition, of course. Money. And they've put out a few trailers, so let's go over those and see what entirely new and original concepts the Pokemon Company has to offer us this time. Starting with... The Region. Okay, so this time the completely logical Pokemon globe has expanded to the region of Padilla, a region designed to be the Pokemon equivalent of Spain. Seen here, and if I'm honest, the shape is actually kinda close, or at least for Pokemon games it is, in terms of general shape. The landscape is beautiful. If you can get past the frankly disgusting appearance of the trees, honestly, it's criminal. Then you can see the wondrous land and all it has to offer. There's rolling hills, beautiful oceans, and expansive cities. The entire region lays bare for us to be seen here from this lovely map. From here, you can see all the wondrous attractions it has to offer. There's, of course, Isolation Island for the criminally insane. There's the Petunia region's famous log flume ride. And there's, of course, the Summoning Stone where the blood rituals take place. And all of that blossoms out from this large central city in a great big donut formation. Geographically, that's technically what we're looking at overall, a luscious big donut. And at the center, this being Spain and therefore a Spanish donut, we have what has been affectionately become to be known as the Churro Hole, right there in the center. So named because if you were to take a regular donut shape as the island is, and then put a churro through the middle of the donut where the hole is, it would combine to make a complete land therefore effectively repairing the gigantic death rift at the center of the continent. We can only be so lucky and hope. However, no churro has been spotted. This region is also special in other ways though, as not only is it open world, but we'll be able to do the gym challenge in any order we wish. So theoretically, if I wanted to start out by challenging, say, over here in this desert area first, there shouldn't be anything discouraging me from doing that. I'm sure that'll be fine. It is an interesting concept, and I do hope it works, and I can't wait to see all the speedrunners and the community figures figure out the fastest order and most challenging order. Stuff like that should help with some replayability and variety, especially assuming that the gym leader's team will probably change depending on the order that they're handled. Or at least, hopefully they change and they don't just pile levels onto the early gym leaders if you face them last. Next up, of course, is the Pokemon. Yes, Pocket Monster is more than a name for my chorizo. For what would this franchise be without elemental demigod-like wildlife to be captured and exploited for personal gain? In the Paella region, we of course have some new varieties of Pokemon. First up, there's the starters. There's Quaxley, aka Mario Kart Duck, Quaycoco, the best one, and then there's Sprigatito, the one the internet got immediately very weird about for absolutely no reason. Ugh. But of course, there's more than just the starters. We also have Meme, and Pikachu who fell over, and Smoliv. That's an olive, and small. But you see, that's what's so interesting about Pokemon, because you have no idea what potential this thing has when it evolves. Look, there's every chance it's just a forgettable, early root grass type, and it won't get used outside of Nuzlocks where there isn't really much of a choice. And when it evolves, it'll just look like, I don't know, two bigger olives. And perhaps if they somehow get a third form, they'll naturally grow a body that's a martini glass. But, 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 you and I both know there's equally the chance this thing evolves into some kind of sexy leaf olive branch lady with big round olives in all the right places and glistening wet dripping with olive oil and for the next year of our lives or so we're going to be filled with more tee hee and not next virgin anymore jokes more than any of us are even remotely comfortable with. 
Look, you know I'm right. Moving on. Next we have Sir Titan, the living embodiment of a spiked club that looks like it despises its own existence. There's a new whooper, but now it's gross and boneheaded. Plus Fido, the perfect representation of real life as we slowly destroy canine species by making them all inbred. I just can't wait for this thing to evolve into a lab-bred door. Maybe it'll be like the rest of the food-based Pokemon and change types upon evolving become literally fairy-bred. Ha ha ha, the possibilities are just endless, aren't they? We also have cloth, the sound you make when something gets caught in your throat, or when lab-bred door sneezes. <laughs> Honestly, I'm surprised it isn't bread too. I mean, come on, it was right there, it could have been crustacean. Frankly though, being pure rock, it's a bit of a letdown. All we can hope for now is that it evolves into a superior form. <laughs> Next up, we have the latest edition. Griffey, Captain! I can't hear you! Griffey, Captain! Captain! And look at this! Look at this filthy little gremlin! She uses some natural. Ooh, I love that freaky shit. Oh yeah, he's the gnarliest Pokemon this side of the Pinata region. It ain't your original 151 anymore, Grandpa. I bet he learns the move Kickflip. Now watch as he ollies over the Churro Hole. But the fun doesn't stop there. We have other new Pokemon, like Armourage. And I don't know who, but somebody's gonna sue. For real though, doesn't it look like this dude just killed and hollowed out some phalanx to wear? And in addition, we also have a counterpart to Armourage, who is, uh, you know, this was meant to be fair. Like, we'll get to it, but Violet is crushing it. This is Cerule Edge, who unfortunately died during a throat slitting incident whilst trying to put food in its mouth, but came back as this awesome vengeful sword spirit with gravy boats for legs. I don't know about you, but I'm down. Though, honestly, on a serious note, it is actually pretty cool that in games based on the past and the future, the one revolving around the future has a sword-wielding Pokemon with ancient weapons appearing as a ghost from the past. However, the one about the past has a warrior with a proto-firearm as a weapon, with its pot cannon thing, as if a hint of what is to come in the future. Good job, I seriously appreciate that. But last up on the list we have the legendaries. Well, except for this Geico bicycle that is called Cyclazar. Every child has a Remlazar. <laughs> yeah, Cyclazar. Whatever, I'm sure he's tied to them anyway, look at him. It reminds me of whenever I see myself in a family photo. You can just automatically tell who the failure is. But aside from that mistake, there is these two. Coridon and Miraidon. Because both of them are Pokemon that you can ride on. Boy, this guy got the shaft, didn't he? Or I guess technically didn't. But Coridon here is the perfect embodiment of the past. It's rugged and primal and too stupid to figure out how wheels work. I think he just foresaw how popular powerful thighs were gonna be these days and decided that efficiency was nowhere near as important as never skipping leg day. That boy got them ancient gains. Now, let's check out the thighs of his competition. Well, no matter, because where we're going, we don't need thighs. Look at this thing. I just, <sighs> Violet is just doing a victory lap right now. Seriously, there is very little to compete with this. And honestly, I'm an old man. If we're going to be mostly traveling around on these things for the whole game, I think I'm picking the smoother ride without the constant bouncing motions on the screen and the running noise droning forever and over and over and over in my head. I mean, what I'm basically trying to say is, at the end of the day... I have a blue eyes white dragons! <laughs> I have a blue eyes white dragon jet, your argument is invalid. <laughs> But those are the new Pokemon we know about. There are returning Pokemon as well, but who really cares about them? There's only one that matters, and that is finally, the goat has returned. That's right, after all these years, the literal goat of Pokemon is finally back in a game. I mean, I won't be using it, but it's there. The only other real info we have to discuss is version exclusive, which don't really say much right now, except for perhaps it's fitting that you shouldn't get Scarlet if you don't like old rocks. Whereas Violet, on the other hand, gets the benefits of the future, like another cool dragon and the return of Club Penguin, apparently. The only downside being that if you want to use Miraidon, there'll be another dragon to overlap it with Salamance. But honestly, I feel like Coridon is going to be rock dragon type, 
therefore it'll fit the ancient theme and also it'll overlap with the pseudo in that game which is Tyranitar. I feel like that's intentional that you pick either the pseudo or the legendary for a diverse team otherwise there's an overlapping type. It also means that if Maradon is electric which feels likely in a fight Karadon would actually have the advantage which is pretty cool. Now onto characters. Those lovely, mute, useless human shapes dotted all over the map. First off, there's us, the player character. And apparently our names are either Florian or Juliana, which means our names are more interesting than anything else about us. Because I don't know about you, but there's nothing I wanted more than to look like a do-gooder on their first day of big school. Give me goodbye kiss, mummy. Thank Arceus for character customization, though honestly with what we're working with, it feels like there's some battles you simply can't win. Next up we have Nimona. She's an upperclassman at your school, and these days you're pretty typical Pokemon rival if I'm honest. Though unfortunately she has a crippling case of Carpal Tunnel. But hey, what are you gonna do? She's in those years, and uh, you know, ambidexterity is a gift that very few possess. After her, then there's Arvin, who is trying desperately to seem interesting using his oversized, floofy Brian Pillman Jr. mullet to hide his crippling embarrassment about his sheer terror of drowning at all times. As far as a character trait, his whole thing seems to be gathering magic plants. So, he's that guy at school. You rock on, Arvin. A true Sprigatito fan at heart. Next we have Penny, who clearly made a brilliant monetary decision and sold her hair as advertising space for Nintendo Switch propaganda. But unfortunately, all that colour in her hair can't hide her dead grey eyes. Luckily, she channels her dark soulless thoughts creatively through taxidermy. Good for her. But now we move away from the students and into the, you know, closest we get to adults in these series who need us to do all the work for them. First up is Director Clavel, who comes in both orange and grape flavoured varieties. Then there's also Jacques, our not the professor, despite the universal sign of having earned a doctorate, a lab coat, who is instead our homeroom teacher and not being named after a tree. Why he couldn't be named Olia is beyond me, especially since the other two actual professors also aren't named after trees. Where is tradition? That's meant to be half of these games. Or is that a commentary on the fact that uh, we're leaving tradition behind with some of these things? Is that it? They made Violet the better one to tell everyone to move on and get with the times and being the future? Because if anyone should be sending that message, it's definitely not the people at Nintendo or Game Freak. They've been doing the same thing for, uh, well, ever. But yes, despite looking like a professor and acting like a professor, he is not the professor. But that is not the only daring choice made with him and his design. They also decided to stick a pair of nuts on his face, which is certainly a choice. I wonder if we're meant to interpret that he's related to Oliana, who was also nuts in the head. But in a hot way, so it was fine. Speaking of hot, there are some actual professors. The one for Violet, Turo, who everyone calls Chad despite him permanently wearing a Tron wetsuit to school. Surely that has to violate some sort of code. And for Scarlet, there is Sada, who... Oh my god, yes, mommy, violate me. I will buy Scarlet. Tell me I've been a bad train, I mean... I mean, uh, this is Professor Sada, who is single-handedly carrying the Scarlet sails on her back right now. Oh, well, not her back, actually, it's everything else. Although, uh, Sada on her back, that's, uh, ooh, that's, um, that's certainly a thought. But next character, and those next characters are gym leaders. There's everyone's other pick for best girl, who quickly provided 34 reasons why the girl part of that title is entirely optional. And then there's this guy, Brassius, who isn't helping with this overall recurring theme because what the hell vibes are you trying to send me with the deep shadowed eyes and the sadistic spiked whip vine thing? Turn 50 shades of fucked up. I swear, this guy's about to have the first ever gym battle where the gym room will be labeled as playroom. Next there is Gita? Gita? Vegeta. She's the champion? Or champion ranked trainer, I guess? And she is tall. I guess that's enough in Pokemon for a personality. That and she has road for hair. Or shredded up tires. Just straps of leather attached to her head. Reminds me of something. Anyway, let's get her in the ring. It looks like she has a mean chop. 
We do also have a run through of just some other characters. Special shout outs to this girl for at least trying to bring up the numbers for her side. There's a lot more beef on display though, like young port here, which I guess would just be wine. Tell ya, if you're into dudes, this is really the gen for you. There's a whole spectrum here. Take a swing and you'll hit something worth hitting on. Except this guy, presumably a Pokemaniac. How embarrassing. Seriously, who would let themselves be seen surrounded by such lame, goofy merchandise as all that? It's pathetic. Usually, the beauties hold something for those in the more feminine inclined. But uh, I presume this is one, and... Look, no offense, but the Minecraft dress isn't doing much for you, and whoever told you that eyeshadow was a good idea, lied? But yeah, overall the ladies are just not keeping up. But we do have a late contender, do 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 it's Mela, the fire boss of the evil team, who throws her hat into contendership with her huge boots. And she isn't compensating for anything, no stop asking. From the huge locked collar too, we can see that she has indeed spent some time with Brassius. But taking her design as a whole, we can see that her true personality is one of those people who refuses to stop crying that Megas are not coming back, and has decided to express her anger by dressing as her spirit animal Mega Blaziken, in what can only be described as the saddest attempt at fine, I'll do it myself in a Pokemon game. But with such an elaborate design, we can learn more about her, such as presumably with those shoes she farms cranberries on the side. Either that, or we found Cerule Edge's soulmate. By a type 2. Hmm, what's the best she gets one of these? Even if it's only like a post game rematch. But she is one of the evil team bosses, and each will battle us from atop their Starmobiles, crazy tricked out vehicles that will presumably affect the battle in some way. Which sincerely makes me hope for them to have a Steel type boss who is their mechanic who makes all these vehicles and looks like Exhibit. If not, wasted opportunity, do better. But this, of course, brings us to the evil team, those dastardly villains who will impede our path onwards. And apparently in this game they are delinquent students, which really follows a theme. Team Skull were sort of dropout thugs, and Team Yell were passionate younger people. It fits with a consistent idea, so let's see what they have to offer, because I feel confident. You see, I caught on to this early on. They thought I didn't see it, but I did. It's brilliant. See, they're clearly based around racing in this region, but they're also hooligans, right? You want that feeling of like gangs and bad kids, threatening and rebellious, but not too threatening. And they slipped it in. I saw it, they thought they got away from me, but I saw it and it's perfect. Look at this! Here! It's a great design. It has the face covered to hide their identities, which makes sense. It's easy to use them as a team uniform then. They can graffiti areas they've taken over, which you can then free later on, which very teenager-like. It's perfect. They even now have a team mascot Pokemon. It's just like Team Yell had, and it too has similar energy to them. It's rebellious and it's cool. This is excellent, Nintendo. I like the theming. Wait, wait, what do you mean these aren't them? These are the bad guys, right? You have this design, this Pokemon, and this setup. You didn't go with these guys? Who did you go with? What? These guys? These losers? What? Team Star? Look at them! These guys who are as threatening as a me in Mario Kart with all the intimidation factor of Elton John and his f star glasses. <sighs> this is just terrible. In the bin. Get in the bin. Team Star, in the bin. So, apparently, they control areas you're going in, and you clear them out. You beat the bosses and take it back from them. I'm glad to see Pokemon is taking inspiration from cutting edge mechanics like that of Far Cry copy and paste number 5 million and 2. Team Star, you get one star. Absolute letdown and joke. But of course, all of this, all of this is a disguise to the true battle that is waging the bloodiest civil war in Pokemon history. Single toned hair versus two toned hair. Take no prisoners. And now, the plot. Which, okay, we really have no idea, except they're really pushing this three story thing. Although, the more you look at it, that doesn't really seem as special as they're making it out to be. At least two of those stories are just our usual story. The first is the regular gym challenge, and we know that. And the second is the Starfall challenge, which is just, you know, defeating the evil team and taking back their property and such. But usually those two things are just together in one story. All they've done is split them into two separate stories, so now it's not interwoven and connected like, you know, a story. 
They're just different mission types. And the last one is the Path of Legends Treasure Hunt, which is surely whatever is up with the living mopeds. But remember, this is Pokemon, so no matter how many legends you uncover, how many legendaries you catch, the true treasure will be the friends you found along the way, especially your Pokemon. Just, it might come up in like a quiz or something. But as for the Starfall plot, I've got one idea. Is it a theory? I guess not, it's just an idea. If the plot of Sword and Shield was anything to go by, let's be honest, watch me put way more thought into this than Game Freak's going to, but okay, here's a basic idea. Okay, so on the character screen here on the Pokemon website, all the pairs show up together, which makes sense. We are the same person as the main character, but it shows both uniforms and it shows the boy and girl model. There's both professors, which makes sense. They're different characters between the two games, but there are two Clavels, one for each school. Now, likely this is just because they're showing off both models, again, the orange and grape flavor, but no, I say. That's very unnecessary. It's just one color change, unlike all the others. Instead, conspiracy. The plot is that there are secretly two Clavels in the game. There is one for each academy in each game. When you're playing, people will keep saying Clavel is suspicious or doing something odd. Some might even speak bad of him throughout the game, and it builds your suspicion as the player. Lots of people have wondered already if he'll be the big bad guy like Rose was. But rather than just repeat that, it builds and builds and builds and finally you confront him on it. And maybe you even battle him because you accuse him, j'accuse, of being a bad guy. But you're wrong. He's a good guy. But his twin isn't. There is another Clavel who hates his brother and who runs whatever school you don't attend in your game. He is a bad guy and he hates his brother. He runs the other academy, and not only has he impersonated the Clavel you think you were talking to several times throughout the game, but he is behind the creation of Team Star. Because, notice, when you fight them, they're in your uniform. They're not from the opposing school, they're from your school. But in fact, this is a lie. They are from the opposing school. They have been roped into this by the evil Clavel to dress up as if they're from your school and bring down the reputation as a bunch of hooligans and bad kids, ruining that school's image and in an attempt to take down his brother's school, who he despises. And because the themes of the whole thing are past and future, I'm sure that they'll end up being able to look past what happened in their past and look forward to the future and work together and the two things working in harmony, which will be the ending, blah, 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 blah. But you get the point. That's a good idea, right? Like a basic doppelganger plot, surprise twist to there's a brother. There you go, it'll be fun. Use the simple design style of Pokemon to its advantage. All right, moving on. Uh, next up, we have mechanics, and there is only really one new mechanic that isn't like the main thing to talk about, which is auto battling. As you're running about, you can send your Pokemon out to gather resources and do whatever else, but also while it's out, it can auto-battle to grind some EXP on just some random Pokemon while you move. That is pretty interesting and pretty cool. But there are two things that which I really want to know the answer. What happens if it's accidentally thrown out against something way higher level than it? Does it not engage or does it just get murdered? And two, be on notice. We are officially on a countdown clock now to see who is the first one to get footage of its Pokemon auto-battling and KOing a shiny before the trainer can intervene. Just, just letting you know it's gonna happen. So whoever gets that video first, congratulations. And, I'm sorry. And, lastly we have the gimmick, because every game in the Pokemon series has a gimmick, and this one is terrifying! Terastalizing. Oh, I meant terastalizing, excuse me. But this is it. Swarovski Pokemon with funny hats. Here in the Patella region, the Pokemon can possess a special state that can either change their type or power up their existing type. This is probably the closest you'll ever officially get to the fabled Pokemon with a third type. And while it looks peculiar, just like G-Maxing, it once again shows a very creative and interesting battle mechanic that will really change things up and affect the landscape of a battle. Unlike the pathetic excuse for cool that heavily restricted team choices and variety with designs conceived by a nine-year-old that Megas were. Stay mad. On top of that, raids are back too. You can raid for rarer types of terrestrialized Pokemon, 
adding another layer to getting the best shiny that I'm sure is to drive us all insane. But rejoice everyone for your fantasies have finally come true. You can now seek out the ultimate waifu Pokemon, and if you find her with normal type terrestrialization, you can finally put a ring on Gardevoir. You're welcome. I mean, don't get me wrong, this water one here is fine and everything, it's probably pretty rare, but it's not going to get you married to her. Though I guess it is a step in the right direction, I mean it is getting her wet. And that's it. Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. So, is the game in Spain mainly just the same? The question we set out to answer. And I mean, yeah, it kinda is, but there's a lot of new here that I'm really excited to try. Legends was a cool step forward, this seems like the next step on top of that, and I think it's gonna be pretty interesting. As for which to get... Look, honestly, I'm always like a contrarian with this. Not intentionally, but I'm always drawn to the seemingly less popular one. I got Original Sapphire because I thought Kyogre was actually the cooler one. I got Shield because I wanted to try something that wasn't just, you know, crazy attack stat through the roof. That felt very childish. And I did like the design on the Shield. I honestly found it more interesting than just the sword in the mouth gimmick. And honestly, I wanted Scarlet. Or I did until now, honestly. The more that comes out, I can't even really see many benefits to it. Now that's me saying that. I mean, how often am I actually going to see Professor Sada to make it worth picking her? I'm still going to be seeing Maraidon and Cerule Edge way more than that and get way more use out of them. I still haven't put in my order for the game, but I'm honestly about to. I mean, I need to pre-order and get that Pikachu I'll absolutely never use. And I think I've landed on Violet, the normie choice, honestly. For once, I think the cool factor has actually won me over to the popular one. But at the end of the day, either way, I will be getting one of them and playing it. Hopefully uh, one of you guys takes the bullet and buys Scarlet so I can trade because I need that shiny charm to waste away my life. Anyway, that's all for now. I'll see you guys next time. Until then, my name is Rigor, and I hope I did alright. Now go on and get out of here, I've got some uh, research to do for my next video.